Hi, I'm Kevin Cummings. At Investors Bank, we believe in helping our local neighborhoods and improving the lives of all we serve. We're a different bank that makes a difference for our employees, clients, and communities. That's why we're proud to support public television and the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank, the Russell Berry Foundation, Fedway Associates, Inc., PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. The law firm of Gibbons PC. And by Health First New Jersey. This is One on One. That's good acting, man. Yeah. <laughs> I get that a lot. I go to Atlantic City all the time. Like, are you the guy? I go, no, I'm not. This is one you can't afford to miss. They thought that I wouldn't survive it, but I knew I would. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. Everything you wanted or needed to know about knee or hip replacements, you're about to find out. We have Dr. Asit Shah who is Associate Chief, Department of Orthopedics, Englewood Hospital Medical Center. Good to see you, doctor. Thank you, good to see you. Good we were morning. just saying, before we started the show officially, the doctor said, hey listen, shape and size matters when it comes to hip, knee replacements, all kinds of replacements, right? Absolutely. First uh, replacement, was it a knee? First replacements around knee replacements, yeah. In, in the 1970s, we did right. our first ones. And and what was going on then? What were we talking about? And by the way, well, you said we didn't even know the difference between a left or a right we knee. We didn't. We were just exploring even how to approach the knee to do a knee replacement. And we had no idea how metal will react with the body, what kind of uh, bearing surfaces or plastics uh, will react with the body. So we were just exploring it. And today? It's huge. It's a huge billions of dollar market. And lots of people get it done. Okay, so here's the thing. As it's changed, as the whole uh, field has changed, as technology has changed, <clears throat> excuse me, as people's expectations have changed, no longer all metal. No longer all metal. What are we Correct. talking about? By the way, you've brought some, I hate to say props, because they're not, <laughs> they're they're not, not props. Steve Barsha, you got this? I'll, our I'll show you they're a real quick. They're not props, because they're real. Yeah, these are real implants. Um, Steve, you got that, buddy? The side profile of the implant, and you can see it glides back and forth. Right. And then this is a front Which profile. Which one's that? This is a knee replacement. Got it. I don't have a hip replacement with me, but this is probably more com one of the most complex joints in the body. Okay, man, here's my question. Knee. Hold that right there. Mm -hmm. Because size matters so much in this case like this, you were saying someone who, for example, is Asian. Mm -hmm. Is it true that, in general, people who happen to be Asian, a guy who's Asian, tends to be have a smaller knee than someone who is a different ethnic or racial group and therefore would need a different knee replacement? Absolutely. The, one of um, my main focuses on research and design has been the Asian knee. And the markets in Asia are growing at approximately 50 to 60 percent compared to the U.S. And the U.S. knees don't work well in the Asian population. Time out. U.S. knees do not work well in the Asian market because well, what, our knees bigger? Our knees, if you go historically, most of our knees were designed off of cadavers in Iowa. Okay, you can put that down because the cadavers in Iowa got me. What does that mean? Well, we have to start somewhere when we talk about developing sizes okay. and shapes. So you have to look at, in the 70s, we didn't have access to CAT scans. Right. So we had to do cadaver work. And the place where most of the work was done was in the Midwest. And does that have something, is, there, is the issue there, doctor, that Definite geographic variations. Were they bigger? Bigger. Go ahead. Definitely uh, a different population that uh, settled the Midwest versus other parts of our country or other parts of the world. Hold on, time out. What about women? I well, mean, you're talking different... about men in the Midwest, right? Yeah. First of all, white men, white men in, the in the Midwest versus someone who's not a white versus man me. versus you, but versus a woman who has a different size knee, exactly. shape knee. Then how the heck 
are we then a, we're then accommodating all these people who would need a replacement who didn't fit the bill? Well, that's what the research showed. As, as we started giving knee replacements, they weren't doing so well in women or in certain populations. What would happen? Uh, more pain, experienced more pain, wouldn't get the same motion uh, that we typically expect from knee replacements. So we started developing women's knees. Uh, women's knees. That was developed about five, uh, five to seven years ago. Um, How are they different? Smaller sizes, the, the, the shape is different, they're, they're narrower rather than wider for right. every given. The two things in sizes we look at is the, the height and the width. The height and the width. So when we talk about the height of the implant, we talk about the height of the implant. Right. And when we talk about the width, we're talking about the width of the implant. Right. And every population or every gender has a different ratio of height and width. And so let me ask you, in terms of people's, this is interesting, <laughs> the average person mm -hmm. who doesn't know all this. It's very difficult. So much of this is about education. Someone needs a hip, needs a uh, knee replacement. How much of your work, the work of your colleagues at hospitals all across this region who are mm -hmm. good at this work, how much of it is it, doctor, about educating and informing patients about all these kinds of issues and the decisions they have to make? It's important to educate the patients on, and I think every patient should have the right to ask what company you're using or what implant you're using, because there are specific differences among implants that are currently on the market. The general principle is the same of doing a knee replacement or the final outcome of a knee replacement, but the subtleties of it are vary considerably among companies. And most high volume centers will usually have several companies inventory available to them. Okay, but one of the things that I also know is that not everyone has a quote team approach, meaning not every uh, no. hospital, not every um, center that does surgery, this kind of surgery, has a team approach. What is a team approach and what isn't? The team approach is, uh, the future of medicine and the team approach is so important because it allows you to do high volume and it allows you to be highly efficient. Who's on the team? So the on the team itself is your lead surgeon, your PA, your physician assistant, your nurse practitioner, and not only that, the scrub circulating nurses, the anesthesiologist, the assistant to the anesthesiologist, the uh, circulating nurses, and the nurses that take care of the patient on the floor, and the therapist. They're Why do you all need all those players? Team. Because it gives this patient a sense of continuity. And everybody has a role to do in doing the surgery. And it's so important that you get the right implants, the right surgery done exactly the same way all the time. You know what's so interesting it's about it? It's very mechanical. Is it also, sorry for interrupting, Doctor, is yeah. it also to say that part of the team is the physical therapist after the fact? Yes, absolutely. Why? Because it motivates the patient. The physical therapy is so important after this surgery to motivate the patient to constantly move. It's one of the most painful operations you can get. You're, you've operated on the, one of the largest joints in the body. You made an incision over the front of the joint, and the next day you're having them bend that knee. It's, 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 it's a task. Before I let you out of here, yeah. how long are the best knee replacements lasting these days? Most of the data we have say that it goes anywhere from 10 to 15 years. The newer generation operations are lasting between 20 to 25 years or longer. And hips any different? Uh, sim sim similar in the hip. Dr. Shah, I want to thank you. You thank brought you. important information. But no, stay right there. Don't go anywhere. No. You know, we like to move it nice and slow here. Okay. One -on -one. We appreciate it. Good information. <laughs> yeah. Stay with us. One-on-one -on -one will continue right after this. That was fascinating. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. There he is, Tom Marino, co-CEO of Cone Resnick, the 11th largest accounting firm in the country. So far, looking to move up. Uh, you always are, right? Have to. By the way, let folks know, uh, last time you were with us, um, also you're here with your co-CEO. Last time we were Ken here, Baggett. Ken Baggett joined me, yes. But make, uh, put things in context for us, Tom. Uh, Cone Resnick stands for two firms coming together. Describe the firms. J.H. Cone uh, formed in New Jersey, 1919. Uh, the Resnick Group 
merged into J.H. Cone uh, October 1st. Uh, it was the Resnick Group for since 1977, so two firms mm -hmm. form the now the 11th largest accounting firm in the country. I know the firm well. I've been doing a lot of leadership development for the firm um, for the last many years, and I've learned a lot about you guys. And uh, one of the things that's always interesting to me, and we'll talk, we'll talk about the Hurricane Sandy. Uh, we've talked to several CEOs, John Lloyd from down in Meridian and other CEOs about how they've helped their employees as well as their clients deal with the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, which is an ongoing story. Talk about that in a second. But one of the issues that you and I have talked about it's a leadership issue, it's an organizational issue. It's a trend, important issue. Diversity in the workplace and the concerns that you have about diversity in your field, talk about it. I think it's just about the number one issue in accounting today. Uh, they need, baby boomers are gonna retire. They are retiring. Uh, the workforce is gonna change over the next few years. And the problem today, and I'll, I'll get to the women first, about 50% of the graduates today are women, but they're not yet in leadership positions. I, I think of an accounting staff, any accounting staff is probably 60, 40 men to women, but in leadership, it's probably 18% is all that make partner. Because? And that's just not enough. Leave the workforce. Uh, it, they leave? They leave the workforce for the most part. Uh, in my opinion, it's not the glass ceiling anymore. It used to be. But I do, th I do think if a woman wants it, they can have it. Uh, we have put in flex hours, so flexible, just, there's no, there's no uh, scheme. You, you tell us what you want to do. We've instituted a women's program to teach them not just how to be good accountants, but how to be good leaders. I think a firm has to do that. And it, it dovetails into diversity. If you look at the demographics in our country today, uh, age 60 and over is probably 80% white. <laughs> age 19 and under is 35 percent non-white. You can see where the demographics are going. And entry level into the public accounting sector is probably 14, 15 percent. So between a lack of women staying and seeing where the demographic trends of the country are going, accounting firms have to do all they can to raise uh, the, the, the issue and let people know in accounting there is opportunity where, where there might be unemployment in the country today, 7.8. In accounting, it's under 3%. Would it, well, well, why would the unemployment rate be so much lower than the unemployment rate in there, the rest of the country? There's a great opportunity the, the, for, for accounts in this country today. In the past 10 years, I think the accounting profession's grown 20% numbers of people. In the next eight years, we're expected to grow 16%. So why? there's opportunity. Why? There's a need for it. Uh, there's an ever-expanding need for it and, and different types of reporting. Forensic reporting, uh, monitor, fiscal monitoring has, has grown up. Uh, th there'll be different types of reports, not that just the traditional cost basis reports in the past, but other types of reports are going to be needed. Obviously, this is an important area. area. By the way, before we leave it, Tom, if firms do not do a better job here in terms of diversity with women and minorities, what will happen? Accounting firms like a pyramid. A lot of staff on the bottom, a lot of managers. You get up to partner. There's not enough partners. There's, there's really not a firm. I mean, Steve, nobody's going to pay for my retirement but right. when I go. It, it's, an, it's not an option to me. It's a must. And the sad part is you, you look around most large accounting firms today, and it's middle-aged white men exhibiting male pattern baldness. You, you, don't, <laughs> you, you, you just don't. That's not a long-term strategy. That's not a long-term, <laughs> it's not a sustainable strategy is what it's not. Oh, um, we're shifting gears, but uh, part of a long-term discussion you've had. Right after Hurricane Sandy, I tell you, we've been interviewing CEOs from across the region who continue to deal with the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. We're doing this program beginning in February of 2013. It will repeat. Tom, right after, the biggest challenges your organization faced, not just with your people regarding Hurricane Sandy, but your clients. What did you do, and how did you change your leadership? Well, I'm, I'm, I think the leadership stayed its course on what we tried to do and stay faithful to. First thing we did was say, we need to help our people. We had a lot of people who suffered losses right out of the chute before there's uh, insurance, before there's FEMA, before there's anything else. So the first thing we did was say, we don't need to be holding holiday parties this year. We're gonna put that money into a fund and you need to actually form a foundation to do it the right way. So we have another foundation, I think you know about the right. 
the Cone for Kids Foundation, but right. we put a foundation together for helping first employees uh, in need of the hurricane uh, funds. And I think we probably have over 100,000 in with another 100,000 to come. If we can satisfy all our employees, it'll go to other victims, but it'll be through a foundation. We then contacted our, not just our clients, but with uh, non-clients through our internet and put up a how-to. How, what should you do first with your insurance company? How are you gonna deal with FEMA? Uh, there was a lot of tax changes, tax extensions. Here's what you need to do. Uh, we suggested how they set up their own foundations if they're, they're, they want to contribute without getting into run, running a market of tax. Because they don't know how to do a else. foundation a lot of times. And, uh, th not easy. Th they don't. It's not easy. You set it up. To, you know a little bit about C3, that. 501c3, and you need to form, a, I think it's 1023 to get it started right. But there's problems if you do it the wrong way. It's all up. It's all free. Every partner did reach out to their client and s saw if they needed any assistance immediately. Uh, we, we, we let, for instance, the state society CPAs use our offices. We let other accountants use our offices because we're fortunate enough to have our own generator and, and uh, they needed to sustain their business as well as we do. So whatever we could do for both the community and our employees, we did. I tell you, it's interesting. The other part <coughs> of the equation is that the Resnick side of the firm that came on board was very involved in down in Louisiana, Hurricane Katrina. They worked with the folks down there um, in helping the, uh, the state of Louisiana. They, they did m most of the monitoring work in Louisiana, a lot in Mississippi also for Katrina. They've done other hurricane disasters. Monitoring is very important. It's going to be very important here uh, in this state. You don't, there's a lot of money earmarked. You don't want to see it wasted. And you don't need a, a scandal arising out of, out, out of a result of money being earmarked. So we want to make it, sure all of those dollars go where they need to go to the people who need it most. Absolutely. Absolutely. And real quick, 30 seconds, Tom, why can't uh, accounting firms continue to stay the way they are without merging strategically and smartly? Well, some can, first of all. But, some I, can. but, I, but, but I think in 30 seconds or not, there's, there's two scenarios here. Small firms, it's succession. Baby boomers dying, grad, retiring. Um, Larger firms, they need a bigger footprint, deeper specialization. Uh, the marketplaces are asking for it. The PEs, the larger banks, they want a bigger footprint with more depth and more specialization. It'll work for us, it'll work for other accounting firms. Tom Marino, co-chief executive officer, Cohn Resnick, the 11th largest public accounting firm in the nation? In the nation. Growing all the time. Hopefully. <laughs> and thank you for being our partner here on public television. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Great being here. Stay tuned. One on one will continue right after this, 11th and moving up. Perfect. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at infocaucusnj.org. At Visit us online at oneonone.org. Or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. Meryl Brown is director of the School of Communication and Media at uh, the great Montclair State University. Good to see you, Meryl. Good to be here, Steve. Uh, before you uh, came to Montclair State, you've had a fascinating background. Admit this. Washington Post. Help uh, Mon excuse me, MSNBC.com become a reality. Start, help start up Court TV and many other things. All true. How did Montclair State get you? Uh, it's an interesting school at an interesting moment in time with an interesting business and academic model. Uh, it's close to New York City. It's in a great community of media professionals. All of it came together at the right point in time for me personally. Yeah, Dr. Susan Cole, our good friend and partner up there, has been talking about this for a long time. We talked to Dan Gerskis uh, about this, the dean up there, from the campus. And we should also disclose that our partners at NJTV nightly do uh, NJ Today out of one of the many initiatives going on in, in your program, in your school, is the NJ Today comes out of Montclair State. A great opportunity for students, absolutely. Yeah, what, what is that connection? Describe that for us, because that's a piece of a larger equation, but what is it? We have a center at the school that brings together both hyper-local and regional media from throughout New Jersey. Relationship with WNET, which produces sure. NJTV. Relationship with WNYC Radio in New York, which produces NJPR. They do work out of our campus with our students and faculty. And then we have a bunch of other partners who are part of a collaborative setting there, so media can work together both with students and faculty. That, that's amazing stuff. Uh, the, the, the program, the, the school, 
that you're leading is different from so many others, journalism or media programs. And in many ways, you're preparing students for a world, a communication and media world that is changing dramatically. Five years ago, 10 years ago, this would not have existed. That's right. Um, the impact of digital media in both disrupting and in many ways revitalizing the world we live in uh, permeates everything we're doing and changes the whole education paradigm. Everybody needs to understand how these media intersect. And it's trite to say convergence, but we're trying to make sure that we're teaching people how they need to be engaged in all these different forms of For media. For example, Merrill, give us an example. A student today who graduates has to be able to do what? Has to be able to think about prose and text, has to be able to frame a shot with a uh, still camera or a film camera, uh, needs to be able to understand how to use social media as both a marketing and reporting tool, needs to be able to think about software applications and how they make journalism on the web better. Every piece of that is critical to getting people into the job marketplace. Devil's Advocate, so much of what you're referring to is about technology. Technology is driving a lot of it. For those of us old school folks who grew up trying to learn the process of interviewing, and because I've taught at Montclair State at different points in time, um, one of the things that's always concerned me, and because you have an academic background as well as a very practical and successful background in media, I wonder if you think about this as well. Where is the place in all this for teaching some of the ethical issues, some of the more grounded issues of the historical context of what it is we are supposed to be doing in terms of getting information in a way that is credible, balancing information in terms of multiple sides of a story. Am I making any sense here? You make a total sense. Look, our school is in its first year. Right. And one of the principles we're laying down is that you don't leave Montclair State without ethics and without the basics of journalism. Now, how you teach those basics of journalism in a multi-platform world isn't as simple as it once was. You went to a school like ours to become a print reporter or become a television reporter or producer. We can't simply do that because that's not enough in today's marketplace. But all of it has to be grounded on basic journalism and basic ethics and a sense of where journalism fits into public discourse. We're trying to get all that right. And the faculty that you attract is so critical, right? Uh, totally critical. It's one of the reasons I do shows like this one, to get the word out so that we can attract the best people. And we do. Um, people want to be at a different kind of institution that's not wedded to legacy traditions, but is still steeped in journalism traditions. We have New York and New Jersey at our doorstep. And we have this center, which we talked about a moment ago, is an entirely unique opportunity for faculty and students to actually produce media in the real world, if you will, rather than simply in an academic setting. That's a great opportunity to enhance people's careers. They're actually producing it, aren't they? Students are involved in NJTV. Students sure. are working as interns for public radio. Students are working as interns for several different print publications throughout uh, the region. And really, really a commitment to New Jersey is what a lot of that's about. That's so interesting. Help me on this, Jackie. We had a young man who was a Montclair State student, um, did a documentary on his own, wound up with Mike Schneider, our partner. Was it Ryan's Heart? This young man, I don't know if you, you know about this young man, Ryan's Hart, uh, yeah. you, you do know, of course you know, did this documentary <clears throat> through the program, your program. Ryan Miller, right, that's his name, winds up doing this documentary, he gets a heart from a young man um, in another country who was a soccer player, lost his life, and I, 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 incredible story. He winds up on NJTV, we see him, we bring him on, and I'm thinking he's a talented young journalist, storyteller, coming out of your program, who has a bright future, and he learned those skills through that program. And was producing television meriting air and distribution on at public age 20. At yes. age, sorry, I didn't interrupt you, I'm sorry. At age? At age 20, uh, extraordinary, yes. We love those stories. And there are other students like that. There, there are, and you and I can learn a lot from them. They know things we don't know. They have skills we don't have. And the collaboration between folks like us, faculty and students, is really an important part of our educational direction. Much of your job, I imagine, um, for me, I mean, I love this part of the job. This is fun, meeting fascinating people, learning from fascinating people who have experiences that I don't have. This is the, I, I'm not going to say the easy part, but the part I enjoy the most. I don't love raising money. Do you? 
Uh, I love building <laughs> businesses. Okay, and, and I think of this as another startup. Right. I've been involved, as you mentioned, in a number of startups, both traditional media and digital media. Sure. It's part of the fabric of what I do every day. Getting up in the morning to have another business development lunch isn't necessarily my favorite thing of the, of the day. I'd rather be with students. But it's part of the job, and I understand it totally. And it really, because we're talking about people in the communication business, sure. it gives me an opportunity to stay current getting out there with the business development part of it, the fundraising in my pocket. It's so interesting. Uh, Bill, Bill Moyers once said one time, we were talking about this whole question about the business side, and he said, look, if you don't do the business, you don't get to do the other side. Well, you know, so, Steve, one of, the reasons the media, one, of the, one of the reasons the media business is in the perilous state it's in today is that not enough people live by that. We yeah. used to have a thing called church and state, and we think that should come together. You need to understand both parts. Well, Mary Brown, help us understand it. We'll have a continued conversation on the air and off. Thanks for watching. Now let's continue the conversation about this and other important topics and issues on Facebook. Visit my page at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank, the Russell Berry Foundation, Fedway Associates, Inc., PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. The law firm of Gibbons PC and by Health First New Jersey. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com, Everything Jersey. And by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan is growing in the Garden State. Thousands of members in Bergen, Essex, Hudson, Passaic, and Union Counties depend on Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan. And in January 2012, Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan will be available in Somerset and Middlesex counties as well. If you're eligible for Medicare and live in New Jersey, find out more about Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan. Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan. Feel good about your health care coverage. This is One on One. I'm a fool for you, babe. Join me as we get up close and personal with some of today's most compelling personalities. This is one you can't afford to miss. Weeknights at 7 on NJTV and 1230 AM on WNET.